And now we're thrilled to present our speaker, the infamous tech master, renowned innovator, father of Angular, the very popular, Mr. Mishko Havery. Welcome and thank you ever so much for being a part of our journey here today. Thank you for okay. having me. I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Excellent. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. All right. Um, Mr. Mishko, you started programming as a 10 year old. What encouraged or inspired you to start programming and what inspired you to um, follow programming as a career? Very good question. I mean, when I was 10, that was 1986 or something of that sort. So it was a while ago, I was living in Slovakia and um, most people never heard of what computers were back then uh, or what they were used for or good for. Uh, my dad in, enjoyed uh, tinkering with electronics and he read somewhere in the magazine that there are these things called computers. And he had a friend who actually bought one for us and got it all the way from uh, Singapore because he was a pilot and he was able to bring it to, to Slovakia. Wow. Uh, as a result, I was one of the first people in Slovakia who had a computer and I was able to play with it. And, you know, at the beginning, uh, it, it's a, to me, it's a kind of a puzzle. And it's just you enjoy seeing how much you can achieve. You know, can I print my name on a screen? And you just get a rush out of the fact that you can do it. Um, and then you just repeat that over and over. And you say, well, now can I draw it? Can I do it multiple times? And so on. Uh, so I enjoy programming mainly because it's a puzzle. To me, it's a game uh, of figuring out how to do something. Mm -hmm. and, and what inspired you to follow programming as a career? Um, because it's so much fun for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, I look at it really as a, as a problem solving, as, a, as playing with a Rubik's Cube and trying to solve it. Uh, so for me, it was extremely natural to just continue playing with it, continue building games, continue building just simple, simple things um, and, and understanding how things work. And so naturally, when I was graduating high school, I immediately gravitated for this thing because this wasn't work. It was just fun. Mm -hmm. You do what you love. So that's awesome. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Okay. Do engineers have to start? as kids, you know, programming, does it somehow give them an edge over somebody else who doesn't? I think a huge part of, of being an engineer is simply just how long it takes, right? Um, whether you're programming or playing a violin, the number of hours you spend at it matters, uh, it matters a lot. Um, so, you know, can, can you learn playing a violin when you're older? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you can learn that, you can learn piano, etc. It is true that as a, as a kid, you're a little faster at it, mm -hmm. but there isn't really some amazing advantage other than as a kid, you have lots of free time and therefore you can, you can spend on it. But, you know, most kids also spend most of their free time playing video games. Um, back then, there were very few video games and certainly they weren't of the, the immersiveness that you have today. And so programming was actually a fun way to spend time uh, solving these kinds of puzzles. So being a kid helps in the sense that you have lots of free time uh, and you can spend a lot of time working on it, but it's not you know, that somehow you miss the boat when you become older and you haven't programmed. You can certainly pick it up at any point in time. As a matter of fact, some of the great people that I worked with have careers that didn't come from programming. Uh, you know, one person that I worked with and who who's amazing was a trumpet player. Um, mm -hmm. Another person I know, uh, she was, uh, you know, she's no longer with Angular team, but she did amazing work. And she came from a, um, a, a support role of a customer support. And to me, it's always amazing. You know, like I, I look at myself and I'm pretty good at this stuff because I've been doing it for so long. So really, it would be embarrassing if I wasn't. Mm -hmm. When I look at people who uh, just started this, who have done it for three, four years, and who are amazing at it, uh, it blows my mind what is possible. Yeah, that's great news for anyone who's wanting to start it, you know, a little later in life. That's Absolutely, you can totally do it. Uh, you, just, you, you just really have to have a perspective of it, look at it as some fun puzzle to solve rather than mm -hmm. a frustrating thing to learn. Yeah. Oh, your college days. 
yeah, college was fun. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, a first time when you're free to do whatever you want without parents having an oversight on you. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, I, <laughs> I did study computer engineering. Uh, so computer engineering is more focused on the actual hardware, how to build physical computers rather than computer science being focused more on um, the software that runs on the hardware. It, it's interesting that I studied computer engineering, but I actually never practiced it. I practice most of what I practice is uh, software. So really I practice computer science rather than computer engineering. But it, it's nice to, to know how these things work at a silicon level, right? Yeah. Uh, most software engineers, they know how to program, but they don't really understand what's going on inside of the CPU and how it actually works. Um, having a computer engineering degree actually gives you a nice, perspective of understanding well how does this work you know how does the cpu uh, architect it how does it go down to registers latches uh, and individual transistors and how does it in a transistor work how does it get laid out how does it get printed or fabricated inside of the silicon factories uh, so it's a nice nice pers uh, perspective to it so yeah i was at, uh, at rit the nice thing about rit is that uh, the uh, internships are required as part of the education. You know, at first it's very scary, uh, especially for somebody who has never had a job uh, to go to a college where um, internships are required. Like you cannot graduate without having two of them. But after your first internship, you realize there's so much fun and the companies pay you. Like, why wouldn't you do this I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the time? And the really nice thing about it is when you graduate, you are, uh, you know, you, you go to an interview and you, your choice is like somebody who is just fresh out of college and never held a job versus somebody who has had one or two internships under their belt. Um, it's a clear, you know, easy, easy decision to go with somebody who has prior experience because they can talk about it. So, so internships are a great thing to do. Now, if you have, if you, or you already passed the time, the another great thing to do is to just either contribute to an open source project or just publish the work you are doing in the form of open source outside and then use that as a discussion with the employer saying like, look, this is what I built. This is the problems I have solved. This is, and it really shows not only that you know how to build stuff, but it actually shows that you are a self-starter and you can do something on your own. You know, people think that it's all about technical uh, skills when you get hired, but it's really a lot of it is about do you have the motivation and a self-drive and nothing shows that better than um, you are able to build something uh, independent of work without anybody like forcing you to, right? You're just doing it out of your own passion and then talk about it. Uh, that helps a lot because it really shows that this person is intrinsically motivated from inside, right? Uh, rather yep. than uh, extrinsic, bleh, extrinsically, no, that's not the right word either, <laughs> externally uh, from the outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, what this makes us curious, because you started uh, programming really earlier on. So did, did you at any point feel like it was relevant uh, for you to go to a structured kind of college environment? Or did you feel like you could be self-taught and do more projects independently? Uh, you can certainly be self-taught. There is amazing resources on the web, whether uh, it's Udemy or one of those existing things, or just free online uh, uh, tutorials you can follow along. So there's wealth and wealth of information on there. And really the only thing that's stopping anyone from, from going through it is time and persistence. That, that's really what, what's behind it. Now, in the case of a college, it is nice to have a formal education. You learn certain things like algorithms uh, and so on. And I even remember when I was going to college, they're talking about object-oriented programming. And this was new to me. I knew how to program in basic and I knew how to do assembly, but I didn't know object-oriented. And I remember I was frustrated for a long time before like one day I was lying in bed and I was like, oh, that's what they meant. And it all just clicked and it all made sense. So, you know, struggling, when, when learning things, it's just normal. It, it's just part of it. And no matter how much prior experience you might have in other areas, there's always gonna be moments where you just can't seem to grasp a particular concept. Yep, yep. Well, 
in 2021, is higher education still mandatory to be a Google engineer? It's a good question. Um, you know, for a while, Google had the reputation that they would only hire uh, people from the top tier universities, and it would be it was probably difficult to or harder to get in there. I think at this point, um, the Google has become more of a mature company, and it looks just uh, for people to have a track record of delivering things, whether it's at other company or an open source projects or just projects by yourself that you do in your free time. Uh, I, I know that it, I, I do a lot of interviews for Google, and um, I, I know that if somebody would show up um, to an interview and bring along just something as simple as flashing LED on the microcontroller uh, and show me like, hey, I built this and look, it flashes, you know, the pattern of whatever, it doesn't matter. Like that alone uh, would mean a lot to me because it shows that the person has passion for these passion. things and they can follow their own passion to build things and they can follow it all the way to the completion. It's, it's interesting that most of the times uh, when, when there are interviews, people don't actually bring anything along like that. And you know, nothing makes you stand out more in an interview than just bringing something like that along. Yep. Yes, passion does trump so many other emotions most of the time. Yes. So to answer your question, I don't think it's, it's strictly necessary anymore. I think uh, now it's a lot more about just um, uh, showing prior um, abilities or just uh, you know, showing a passion to the, to the employer. Yeah, and that's great news, right? That's really good news. Yeah. And Google also hires a lot of interns uh, and a lot of people who are just starting. So there's definitely different kinds of levels of, you know, you could get hired at the entry level and all the way up. And the, the thing that you're looking for is really just somebody who can grow, somebody who can uh, be fun, at, you know, at the team, mm -hmm. uh, who's not a person by themselves and who can participate in team activities and who's open to learning. And if you can demonstrate that you can learn, um, you know, we all learn all the time. Nobody shows yeah. up with the perfect set of skills. Uh, it's all about just being able to pick up new things. Absolutely. All right. What should we as freshers know about the life of a programmer? Your advice for newly graduated freshers. Mm. It's, I would say programming is, um, it's like a third frustration because nothing's working. A third scratching your head, of like, why isn't this working? Mm -hmm. And about, you know, a third of like total joy of like, yeah, I finally got it. I figured it out. Um, that, that's a lot of what coding is, but it also, a lot of coding is, is talking to others and trying to figure out like, how does it fit together? You know, it, it the days when you uh, a single pro person could build something are kind of gone. Things are pretty complicated these days. And so we expect that we have teams and having the skill to chat with other people and figure out what exactly the other person is trying to say and incorporating that and then working together as a team, that's actually a very good skill to have as well. Mm -hmm. Did you stand out in some way when you first started out? Like what was your strength as a fresher? I don't think I stood out any in particular other than maybe that I was annoying um, <laughs> when I was younger, hopefully not so much these days. Um, you know, when I look back, I think the only thing that really differentiates anybody, not just myself, is what people often refer to as grit. You know, the ability to just continually chip away at a problem and not give up. Uh, you know, if, if, if you get stuck, that's fine. Take a break, do something else, read something else, look at it from a different problem. But just this continuing ability to just constantly chip away at a problem um, is, is kind of the magical thing to a lot of things in life, not just coding, uh, just about anything in life. It, it, it is interesting to me how often people give up um, pretty early on uh, without uh, for and it, it in a way it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy you know like oh I, I've given up this because I'm not good at it but I'm also not good at the other things either but then you're like well the, how much time did you actually spend you know if you if you talk to experts usually experts say that to master anything you need to spend about 2,000 hours on it right 
So did you spend 2000 hours on a particular problem and you still aren't getting it? I really doubt it. You know, after 2000 hours on a particular problem, usually uh, people figure things out. Yeah, I really, really like that. I mean, to stay positive and persevere. I really like that. Yeah. Yes. Perseverance is an important skill at it. Mm -hmm. All right. Working for the big tech, how did you make the leap uh, to well-renowned companies like Adobe and Google? Uh, I guess it's it's a kind of iterative process. You you start at smaller companies like Questra, you, you build up uh, your skill set, and then you go on to bigger companies and you have good uh, you know interviews with them. You kind of show them what you know. You know, you can have a standard interview where they just ask you questions and you answer, or you can kind of take the interview into your own hands and say like, hey, by the way, look the cool stuff I've built. Um, I'm really passionate about it. And, you know, I, I struggled with this, but I finally, after many hours, I figured out how to do that. And I think that is, is helpful. Uh, for me, I, I, I had, was lucky enough to have internships when I was still in college. Uh, for both Intel and Xerox. Okay. I worked with a couple of small startups that don't exist anymore. You know, they, they weren't successful. Uh, and I worked for uh, some companies that kind of don't exist anymore, like my, Sun Microsystems. They were mm -hmm. kind of bought up. And I worked for Adobe and, and Google. And uh, all of it, it was very different. And all of it was a lot of fun. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's a good experience. And, and the, the secret to it really is just to iterate and try again and again. Right. Try again and again. I think that's, that's also one thing that the students must remember to not give up. Thank you for that. Um, now we come to the foundation of Angular. Please let us know the story behind the creation of Angular. What were some of the challenges we're dying to know? You know, there's this external story or uh, that people say, which is, hey, you know, I had an idea for Angular and I built it. The reality is not that simple. Uh, in, in reality, you know, I spent many years building smaller frameworks that nobody ever heard of. Uh, you know, and, and when you are at a team and you're building a web application, you always look for ways to reuse things, reuse, simplify things, uh, make this make code consistent. And so on various projects that I've been, I built various kinds of frameworks to deal with various problems uh, that are there. Most of these frameworks, you know, no, nobody has ever heard of outside of the project that they were used on, but it does build up a, a, a skill set for you, right? And then eventually, when the situation is right, um, you can build something that a lot of people actually use. Now, in the case of Angular, um, the advantage was that Angular was fundamentally different and new. The web was new. The, the web applications just kind of started to happen. And so there was a void. There was a void for a framework to come in and Angular just happened to be lucky enough to be one of the first ones. And that's why it was so successful at the beginning. You know, at this point, the ecosystem is uh, filled with lots of other choices. You have React, you have Vue, you have Swelt. And these are all excellent frameworks that already exist. So you can tell a story of like, oh, you know, it's a moment of brilliance and there it goes, it's Angular. But the reality isn't that. Like the reality is that you try many, many times and you fail many times and you become unsuccessful many times. And then eventually, sometimes you, you get successful and it's it makes a good story to say like, oh, it just, did it, but the reality is always more complicated. In the case of Angular, I actually wanted to build something completely different. Uh, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to simplify the way web apps are built, but the original guide for it was to build it for people who don't know how to um, develop code. The idea was like, oh, you're not a full developer in the sense that you don't know how to write code, but maybe you do know how to do HTML. And so could I somehow let those people, uh, allow them, give them the ability to build simple web applications. And so that was the idea of Angular. Over the time, the Angular morphed into more of a developer's toolbox, um, and which is what it is today. Uh, but it's always interesting to know that people rarely have clear visions at the beginning. You know, visions are something that you work on and you talk to a lot of people and find out 
and then refine them over time, right? So Angular became from this thing that was meant to be for non-programmers uh, and had both a front end and a back end component to it to something that only has a front end component and specifically tailors to developers. Uh, so that's a big, big jump. And part of it is when you build something like that, you need to focus on the customer. So you need to get a customer that's using it and listen to their feedback, you know, tell them what problems they're running into and then help solve their problems. And so over time, you, you can build a framework like that. And so I think that's, that's what happened to Angular. It was mm -hmm. uh, part luck, part good timing, and part um, you know, hard work that I managed to build few other frameworks before that. So I kind of knew a little bit what I was doing. Any moment of epiphany during the creation of Angular? Any memorable event? <laughs> there, there's always moments of, of epiphany, but they're, they're, they're different levels, right? It's, it's usually they're the small stuff, like you're stuck on, you don't know how to solve something. And, and finally you're like, oh, I'm looking at the problem the wrong way. I'm holding it the wrong way, right? If I only hold it this other way, then I get to see the solution. And then a lot of things in life are that way, which is that you don't know how to solve it. And the problem looks intractable. And then when you just look at it a different way, you just frame the problem differently. All of a sudden, the, the, the problem becomes trivial and easy to solve. Um, you know, math has lots of examples of that. We call them transforms. Uh, but I think the same exact thing works for human brains, which is that if you can just ask the question in the correct way, the answer becomes pretty self-obvious. And that's part of the reason why once people do something, the answer is obvious because part of uh, them trying to figure out how to do that is, is, is the ability to ask the question in the correct way. Mm -hmm. and, and then at, at that point, the answer is obvious, but it wasn't obvious before. Yep, yep. That's interesting. But now we're curious, is it possible for everyone to create a new idea? Is there a method for everyone to pursue to create a new idea? I, I think people have lots and lots and lots of ideas all the time. Uh, so certainly the answer is absolutely yes. Will every single idea become successful? Well, that's a lot of it depends on luck, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a common fallacy that people think that when they're successful, it's because of them. And if, they're, if they fail, then it's because of the external reasons uh, around them. Uh, I, I think you, you have to realize that even if you're successful, it is still a lot of it is luck, that you just happen to be at the right place at the right time. Now, it is true that the luck favors those who are prepared. And so if you spend a lot of time and you have a lot of knowledge, you are more likely to take advantage of the situation um, and succeed in, in that sense. Right. But I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> I think I went on tangent. Well, so would say that it's possible for everyone to create a new idea, but whether it's successful or not. Yes, absolutely. You know, ideas are something that you have all the time on how to, I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, I have a requirement. I would like you to build this particular thing, right? It is up to you and your ideas on how you actually make it work. Nobody tells you, I need you to specifically do these if statements and these for loops and these function breakdowns, right? To, to get the solution. Everybody says, I want it to do X. I want it to behave this way. The choices you make in order to make it work are, are really of your own. And all of them uh, are a, uh, you, you do it by trying, by failing, mm -hmm. trying again. And, and doing it over and over again until you get something that works. And so you have lots of good ideas that are good ideas at the beginning and then turn out to be bad ideas later on. Or it's really not that they're bad ideas, is that you really haven't understood the whole problem. And once you understand the whole problem, then typically there are certain hidden things that may make this thing problematic that you thought was such a wonderful idea before. I agree. I, I think it's important to understand the problem fully. That, that's really nice. Yep. Now we're going to move on to one of my favorite, favorite questions. What is your principle as an engineer? My secret sauce, huh? You want to know how <laughs> this is done. <clears throat> yep. Uh, so I, 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 to me, this is so simple that it's obvious, but I always find it strange how few people actually do it. And, and the answer is to do it backwards, which is you 
pretend that there is no constraints. There is, you can have anything you want and you come up with a solution in this wonderful world where everything is possible. And then you look at, you decide like, okay, so this is what I want. This is what I think would be solving my problem. And then you work backwards and you say, okay, so I have these constraints, you know, the language can only express this or I have this much memory or this much money or something of that sort. And then you try to play with these things to see if you can at least get reasonably close to the goal that you have. I think if you start from the other end where you say, well, I have these resources, how do I assemble them in order to get to some good destination? You tend to use all of the resources in the way that they were specifically intended. Whereas if you look at it from the other way, then you can say like, hmm, I know I have a hammer and usually hammers are used for hammering nails, but maybe I could use a hammer as a doorstop, right? To solve my problem. Not intended for it, but it solves the problem. And so by working backwards and looking at the constraints and seeing how you can fit, um, fit them in, I think you can, um, it, it's a better way of doing it because you're not, uh, encumbered by existing constraints about how things should be done and usually children are very good at it right like older people have all kinds of weird things in their heads about like how you're supposed to use stuff or you know like for example uh when i was in slovakia the way you opened the banana is you bit the top off and then i was blown my mind was blown when i moved to the u.s that you could break the bottom off of it too and i was like wow like i've been doing it wrong all this life uh, and so, so much of life is just like you're doing things in the way that it's been always done or you've seen other people doing it uh, until you realize that there are other ways to, to take on this. And so the ability to just say like, hey, I'm going to be like a kid over here and just try to use stuff in any way I can think of to see if it actually solves the problem. I think that's a very useful skill. And it's a skill we all have, but we somehow have forgotten it. I mean, we did it as yep. kids, right? Yep. Yep. I agree. So your principle is absolutely amazing. I would like to exist in a world where anything is possible and then I wor work backwards to, you know, to the reality. You do every day when you go to sleep. <laughs> you have yep. that world. Yep, yep. Back then, let's say 10 years back, when people were using HTML, CSS, and JS for development, what makes you think that a new framework can reduce a lot of boilerplate code and become a new technology? And what was the thinking process of it? I don't think anybody has these ideas out in the vacuum. Like you have to have prior experience. And so my prior experience was that I built many web applications and I saw that a certain set of problems just always cropped up, right? You always had to deal with these things over and over again. And at some point you just get tired of it. You're like, okay, I'm building another application, great. And now I have to solve the same problem that I've already solved five times before. And, you know, first few times it was fun, the fifth time, not so much. And so you start, you know, looking for ways to make sure you don't have to do it again. And that is really um, uh, how things happen, right? Like you, you've done something, you feel the pain, and then you say to yourself, okay, can I somehow simplify this? Can I make it so that the pain is not here so that I don't have to do this again? And this is kind of the origin of all inventions. You know, yes, it looks amazing in, 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 in vacuum where you're like, oh, there was no framework and now there is framework. But if you look at it in the context of, well, I was building an app, I had this particular problem. I wanted to make this simpler. It just kind of becomes like a natural next step. Like, oh yeah, of course you need probably some kind of a templating language or something that deals with data binding and so on so that you can simplify these things. So if you know the individual pieces, um, it helps. Uh, having prior experience, having the, you know, the experience of suffering these problems on your own skin is really helpful. All right. We have the next question from Japan. What makes a good programmer? What is the difference between a great engineer and others? So there is a certain basic level of, of coding that you need to have, right? You, you need to be able to uh, be productive. 
Um, but what really separates uh, people is, is not so much the coding, although that is a certain level of basic requirements that is re required, but it does come to uh, how well you can work with others. And that is a very broad thing. Like as engineers, we're typically thought of as hermits that we enjoy our code and nothing else. Mm -hmm. But working with others is an important part. And, and it really comes down to the fact that there is only so much you can do by yourself. And at some point, you have to get help of others. Not only that, but you need to uh, convince others of different directions, right? So how do you do it in a um, helpful way to, to get towards your goals? And so, you know, people think always focus on the hard part of just coding. And that, that is super important. You need to have that. But to really distinguish um, the top line engineers is you have to go beyond coding and you have to look at how they work with others, how they influence others, how they work uh, and inspire others to, to work for, for a particular goal. Mm -hmm. We have so many questions pouring in, Mr. Mishko. Okay, the next question again is from a Japanese student. How much time did you spend studying every day as an engineer? I think the word studying implies that it's something you do you don't like. <laughs> I, I like to think of it more like tinkering. You know, it's, it's just fun to figure out how stuff works and to break it apart, um, you know, and just basically disassemble it. And whether you're disassembling physical things mm -hmm. or disassembling um, games, it's the same thing. I remember one of the first computers I had was a Sinclair Timex. And I wanted to play video games, right? Just yep. like everybody else. And mm -hmm. after a while, you keep playing video games and you get frustrated because you keep losing. And, you know, yes, you could keep playing more or you can say like, hmm, let's see if I can trick the computer in letting me win. And so you read up on some stuff, you see like, can I, can I find the piece of code in this computer where they're decrementing your health? Like it's gotta be somewhere, right? Somewhere there's a piece mm -hmm. of code that says decrement health. And, or there's a piece of code somewhere in this computer that says, if the health is zero, the game is over, right? So all I really need to do is find a piece of code and delete it. Now, it's a nice game of hide and seek that you can do for a few hours, maybe a couple of days, but eventually it turns out you can find this. Um, and then you have a game that you never die. And so you can just play it forever. So when you people say studying, to me, this wasn't studying, this was just fun. Like I wanted to play the game and I was frustrated that I was losing. And so I was essentially cheating and cheating is fun at some circumstances, right? I mean, nobody, there was no victim in this, mm -hmm. this sense. Uh, and so in, in this way, uh, cheating is, is, is fine and okay. Um, but that's really how you learn is, is that to you, it's not work. It's just fun because there's a goal that you have and you're trying to get there. That's super, super cool. All right, the next question is, how long do you reckon building a framework takes? <laughs> I have no idea. I've been working at it for 10 years and it's not done. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know, people have this idea that you work on something and then it's finished. There is never anything finished in software. You either, uh, it's used by people and therefore it's not finished and you work on it or you don't work on it because it's dead and nobody uses it. There isn't really nothing else in between. So there isn't really finish in that sense because you always, you know, if you build something, it's useful. And then you have ideas and you say, hmm, if I change this, I will make it even more useful, right? And so you go ahead and, try and change that. And then you realize, oh, if I change this other thing, I will make it even more useful. And usually the number of ideas you have um, of how to make something more useful vastly outnumbers the amount of time you have to actually implement them. So you never really run out of things to do. And so you always keep making things better and better. Uh, also, there's always infinitely number of bugs in the system all the time. So that's, that's another thing you always have to do. All right. There's another question from Japan. Okay, for example, I'm a beginner of programming and I want to be a great programmer, what should I do first? What are the options? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, as I said, the skill, like any other skill, it's like asking like, 
I'm a, uh, I, w- I, I just learned how to bike and I'm not very good at it. How do I get better at biking? Well, you just have to bike more. There is really no shortcut to it. Uh, and, and so you just have to code more. Like you have to build problem. You have to be faced with problems and you have to keep trying to solve them and implement them and doing it over and over again. It really comes down to just the amount of time you spend doing it. Yes, you can read books and they are certainly helpful, but nothing beats just the actual uh, time spent doing this and writing code. Okay, thank you for that. Oh, we're just looking for some more interesting questions and we have only 20 minutes for that and we have so many questions. All right, moving on to the next question. Today's market for beginners, in your opinion, is it easier or harder to start off a career in programming in today's I think it's market? Easier uh, as it's, it has ever been. Well, there, there's two things. You know, back when I was starting, the computers were so much simpler. You know, it was possible for a person to understand basically everything there was to understand about a computer. Today, things are pretty complicated, but luckily, we also have some amazing tools. You know, you can write and build some amazing things without really understanding everything about a computer because you have tools, you have frameworks, you have libraries that offset all these knowledge. So in a lot of ways, um, it, it is, it is uh, easier to build amazing things, but it might be more difficult because it's more overwhelming. Uh, because, you know, back when I was starting, that was really just basic and nothing else. So you didn't have a choice of what programming language to choose. You just had one thing to do. Today, there's a myriad of things to choose from. And so that, in, in that sense, it makes it more, more difficult. Uh, but it, it's, it's kind of the illusion of difficulty as in like, you think it's difficult because there's so many choices. Uh, but it turns out like, as long as you choose one and you stick with it, you eventually figure it out. And after you figured one thing out, the knowledge transfers to other areas of expertise, right? So yep. somebody who can look at a problem and solve it quickly, it's not because they're smarter, it's because they've been in a similar situation before mm-hmm. and they have solved it. And so they're cheating essentially because they had like, oh, I've seen something similar before and the answer before was this. Let me fudge the answer a little bit, see if it fits over here. So that's fundamentally is just taking a shortcut, right? Yep. Uh, and a lot of what software engineering is are these kinds of shortcuts. It's like, I just happen to have seen this before and therefore it, it, I know how to solve it. And externally, it looks like, oh my gosh, I, he just knows the answers all the time. When it really it just becomes, I've just seen it before. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. The next question, Mr. Mishko. I have three semesters of college education left. Computer information system. I'm so much into computing. And so I'm registered with TechIS for the web development program. What advice can you give me as an aspiring developer or programmer? And what program is more in demand in the tech field? Mm. <laughs> uh, on some level, it doesn't matter uh, because these things are highly transferable. If you learn Angular, then you will probably be okay doing React and vice versa. Um, if you know how to do JavaScript or TypeScript, you probably can do Java and so on. So in, 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 in a lot of ways, it, is, um, it, does, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Now, it is true that a lot of people currently are choosing the web technologies because they're so ubiquitous and it solves the problem of how to do it on the client, how to do it on the server, how to do it on a mobile device and so on. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, JavaScript or rather TypeScript is a pretty popular thing today. And it is, if you look at GitHub, uh, you can look at which languages are used by how much. And you can see that TypeScript slash JavaScript is certainly leading the way along with C and C++, the good old languages that we've been around for like 50 plus years. All right. Uh, Another question from Japan, Mr. Mishko. Uh, I'm in marketing now, but how much engineering should people in business side position study? How much engineering should people in the business side study? Um, 
any amount you study is going to be useful because you will create a common language how to talk to the engineers, right? The biggest problem when two people talk is to find the common vocabulary and the common ground and the common context that they keep in their heads when they discuss ideas. And so by um, learning basics of programming, you can become more effective at marketing because you're essentially becoming more effective at talking to engineers and having these ideas and discussions, et cetera. Um, you know, we're a social animal. There's a lot of, uh, of what we do is about being in groups and talking to groups and influencing groups. And um, being able to talk the language of the other person is highly useful skill to have. So I would say any amount, even if you never become a great developer, just the fact that you understand like how the pieces work together, at least in theory, is super useful in having discussions with people. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm from the business like management side, and you know, I think it would help me tremendously to know a little bit more about engineering. All right, next question. Do you really think algorithms are necessary for web development? Take your Angular as an example. Do you think algorithms help you as a developer or to develop Angular? Yes. Um, so for something like Angular, algorithms are highly important. Um, but you can build a lot of web apps without really knowing how these things work. Uh, you have, for example, a hash map, right? It's a container where you where things are associated by name, or sometimes we call it key, key or name. Uh, and there's some value, right? There's basically pairings, one-to-one -one pairings, and, and it's a bucket that contains a lot of things. You don't need to know how this particular data structure works as long as you know how to use it. And you can go a long way uh, just, just using it this way. But at some point, you should be asking yourself like, well, but how does it actually work? Like, how does the computer do these things underneath it, right? There isn't some magical way to pair things together. Like there has to be some mechanism by which this is done. And, um, and having understanding these algorithms is important because it gives you insight into, well, what be, will be fast and what will be slow, what will be efficient and what will not be efficient. Can you build a lot of apps without understanding this? Absolutely, you can do a lot of things. So it's not strictly required. Are you gonna have a better understanding of the world if you do know the algorithms? Absolutely. If you wanna build something like Angular, like a framework, there, there's lots of advanced algorithms that you need to do because one of the goals for a framework is to be efficient. And being efficient uh, really comes down to some creative ways of keeping track of things, right? Essentially, if you think about it, computer is just this thing that keeps track of a lot of different things. As humans, we keep track of like seven things at a time and then you forget them, right? But computers need to keep track of millions of things all the time. And so then you need to have some way of organizing all these things. Um, and this is where algorithms come into play. And how you organize it will have a huge impact on whether this thing will be fast or slow. And if it's slow, then it's probably not gonna be successful. All right. Uh, the next question is from Ramu Matsumoto. Did he study especially math, chemistry, and physics to get into the university that he graduated from? I'm curious about it. Uh, I love all those topics. I love math. I love chemistry. I love biology. Uh, I do computers some, for some reason. But you know, my favorite thing to do is to actually read up on like how does the human body work? Like how you know how does how do we translate DNA into RNA to proteins? How do how the proteins get folded and how they become enzymes and how things work? Like it's just fascinating stuff. I think the I think there's just a class of people like myself that just find everything fascinating. It's not like that I have only interest in computers or nothing else. I have interest in absolutely everything to the annoyance of everybody around me. You know, I just want to know how things work. Like. How does my car work? How, how does my human body work? Why is it this particular way? And I, I love drilling deep into these things, whether it's physics or chemistry. I, I love explaining this uh, to my kids whenever they're willing to listen. So I think it's just a type of people that just love these things. And the thing is, when we were kids, we all asked a gazillion questions. And somewhere along the line, we stopped. And like, how, why? it's fun, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's, and the thing is, if you, you know, you could say like, well, 
the fact that you know a bunch of stuff about biology has no bearing for you on you know what you do in uh day-to-day -day life yeah it doesn't but sometimes it does like sometimes you're like oh this thing here is just like this other thing over there except over here it's mechanical and over there it's it's biology and then you step back and you go like oh yeah but the the biology solved it this way i wonder if i could do the same thing over there and it does transfer rarely but it does transfer um same thing for math i, I love math i took some pretty complicated math when i went to college mm -hmm. probably forgot most of it uh but it was really insightful to be to re recognize that two independent systems are really governed by the same set of equations you know that the way you describe how your temperature fluctuates when you uh, turn on the heater and have a thermostat is the same thing how the wheel on a car will fluctuate as it goes over a bump in the road you know if you recognize that this is the same set of equations that govern these things there's a certain level of joy that you get out of it you're like oh okay that's interesting mm -hmm. yep all right the last question is when did you feel that you grew a lot as a programmer what was your experience i am still waiting to grow up <laughs> i still feel like a kid it is strange to me that i'm supposed to have you know have kids and family and responsibilities but i really still feel the same way when i felt when i was a teenager or a kid uh, i think society places a lot of these arbitrary lines like oh you're 21 you're legal to drink so now you're an adult or something like that and you're like okay i'm waiting for the other shoe to drop so it's something different and nothing changes right you're the same way as you were yesterday um so so the idea that something can grow like it's continuous you always grow like i can certainly look back on how i was as a kid and i realized oh gosh i've done so many silly things shouldn't have done that if i only knew it now i wouldn't have done it that way but you know, it's a continuous process. You never stop. You just keep going and learning. Yep. Thank you so much for that. Sorry that there were so many questions, but your oh, answers no, were super interesting. So it's a pleasure. Yep. Yep. 